maybe I hesitate to say it, but it's a little bit of a a, a, a dirty secret. So if if ocean shipping were a country, it'd be the seventh largest polluter on earth. Now okay. there's tons of work going on within that industry to go to electrification, to go to uh, hydrogen pulsed vessels, um, lots of effort that's going on to reduce that. But it's, you know, there is a, it's a very carbon intensive part of the economy. And, you know, that's something that we can help fix. Okay, thank you for joining me on the show. Rince Leesman. Did I pronounce that right in the right way? Mm, you Rinsed did. Leesman. It's German. Is that German? Rinsed is actually Swedish half of Rinsed Dierna. There's a there was an I E R N A tacked on the end. Now it's J E R N A. That was probably too many vowels when they came over. Um, but it's also on my children are named Katie, Sam, and Jack, just to keep it nice and easy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. See, you're the CEO, but Leesman's German. You're the CEO That's of yes. Columbia yep. Power. Yeah, with the two extra ends in there, right? That's pretty cool. Um, I came across your work in, I can't even remember what article I was happened to be reading, but I was just intrigued about the way your products generate power in the ocean, sort of like this passive, using the motion of the ocean to generate stuff. And I know... There's technology that it has existed for a while, but I've just been curious about where the state of that technology tends to be, especially in your, obviously, the, the products that you guys have been working on. Um, maybe we sh maybe a good starting point is just to kind of give us just a sense of what it en encompasses. You've used a few analogies and descriptions and other things that I've read, um, kind of mix in like a data center, communication center, and a power generation thing. Is that right. still true? Is that still the case? That is still the case. And if we start sort of at the beginning, yeah. you know, there are wind and solar, you know, nothing really to to say there. They're, they're, they're great, but they're not perfect. And the lure of ocean energy, whether it's wave energy or tidal or ocean current or salinity uh, differential, there are a lot of different approaches there, but the lure really is the amount of power that's available offshore and in wave energy in particular where we're focused is very energy dense i mean much more dense than than wind or solar but along with that energy density comes uh, a, a difficulty it's an engineering problem right and it's why we've been working at it for a while and it's why you haven't seen really up until this point uh, commercialized technologies because it's a it's a difficult problem to overcome, and I, I try to frame it in what I call the trilemma. So the trilemma is trying to deal with three separate design issues all at the same time. So you always want to make something that's affordable, and you want to make something that's available. And you want to make something that's uh, acceptable, and by something I mean a, a design, a technology, and each one of those. So availability means that it's survivable and it's reliable and it's delivering power when the customer wants it. Um, and affordable is affordable to the market sector that it's involved in. If you're supplying energy to uh, a, a remote town in southeast Alaska, which is living off of diesel, that number used to be 35, 40, 50 cents a kilowatt hour. It's, I, I hate to think about what it is today. Um, and that's very different than if you're pushing power into the um, mainland grid. Uh, and then acceptable is from a regulatory perspective, from a stakeholder perspective, you got to create something that is acceptable. And it's trying to balance those three things that is really difficult. And that that is really the challenge that's come with ocean energy, wave energy in, in particular. If you try to over engineer something to make it survivable, therefore available, it becomes quickly unaffordable. And so that that's the challenge. That's where we think at Sea Power that we have uh, really sort of cracked the nuts, so to speak, and, and started to conquer the problem as we begin to commercialize our systems. Okay. Um, and okay. So, but just give me a, a sense of like what it, because there's like several, comp there's two components, something that rides on the waves and then it's something that can be moored, right? Or give me a sense of sure, what sure. The, the product design's like. 
There, there is, uh, well, there are a lot of different design choices you can make. We choose okay. to be on the surface where the energy is the greatest. Some okay. people in their technology designs prefer to be on the bottom. That's a different type of technology or somewhere in the water column. But our unit, and we have a, a, a kilowatt scale system and then a megawatt scale system. So the kilowatt scale system, which is the one that's commercializing now, that's called the C-Ray. Um, and then the Stingray is the larger system. Both of those reside on the surface and both are moored to the bottom. Um, our systems are what's called self-referencing, which is a fancy term that means they don't need a tight line to the bottom in order to make electricity. Um, they, they reference off of themselves. And that's an important feature when it reduces the complexity of what you have to put in the water. And as we all know, if anybody owns a boat, you know, anything you put in the water is going to break and it's going to break sooner than you want it to. Um, but that's part of the challenge, too, of being on the surface where the energy is the greatest is uh, you have to be careful what you wish for. Okay. And by self-referencing, it means it's sort of it's attached. There's a cable to the bottom. Yes. But it's adjusting so it doesn't pull away too far from it, right? Is yeah, that no, that, that's right. Um, that's okay. part of the um, importance of the mooring system is that you maintain what's called a watch circle. Um, but by self-referencing, basically the unit works off of itself in order to produce electricity. So with our C-Ray product, it has, there's a, a plate, there's a piece of mass that basically hangs below it that keeps part of the unit um, moving uh, out of phase with the waves. And then there are also two floats that move in phase uh -huh. with the waves. So they're wave followers. Um, so by creating uh, uh, two separate bodies, or really three that are moving sort of out of sync with each other, that's how we generate electricity. And, and with most wave energy systems, they oscillate back and forth. They don't spin in a continuous circle like a wind turbine does. And that's also part of the, part of the challenge is how to effect, effectively and efficiently uh, generate electricity uh, in, in that manner. And you can create electricity. You can electrolyze hydrogen for fuel cell. Uh, it's really the conversion of wave energy or mechanical energy to some other usable form or storable form of energy. Right. So because the, because waves change in the direction they're coming in, you kind of have to have this thing sort of turn to, op, to more optimally take the energy of the wave. And you're moving what, like magnets or something around a coil that helps generate the voltage or something? Yeah, so that's one of the benefits of the design, and we use a single mooring line to the bottom that allows, and our units tend to, or they do, what we call weather vane. So whichever direction that the waves predominantly are coming in, the unit will turn and properly face that direction to be as effective and efficient um, at, at, as it can be. And then the with the C-Ray product, there are two floats, again, that are the wave followers. Those are moving the most around the central nacelle. Imagine sort of three parallel tubes, the two floats on the outside and the nacelle in the middle. And as the floats move, they do turn generators. So in the case of the C-Ray, it's just a gearbox and a generator, permanent magnet generator. You can buy both of those components really off the shelf anywhere. And that's part of the beauty of what we're trying to do is use off the shelf components rather than bespoke systems. But yes, the, so those generators oscillate back and forth and convert the uh, captured wave energy into electricity. And then at the bottom is the storage of that or the usage of it. Is that how, is that the part of the design? Yes, so the so the main energy storage component, we, we store some energy up top too okay. uh, on the surface in the system, but the main energy storage with the predominant configuration of the C-Ray uh, is, is on the seafloor, and we collaborate with a company, uh, Verloom, which is in Aberdeen, UK, okay. um, and that system, so with the C-Ray, where the applications are intended to support mobile and static assets. And what I mean by that is maybe it's a subsea autonomous drone, or maybe it's a piece of data gathering system, or maybe it's a monitoring system. It could be an intrusion detection system. We're really agnostic we, to what the application is. It's more providing power and data to the seafloor. 
And our, our, our goal here is to connect the seafloor to the cloud. And the sea ray and the energy storage, which all together we call an autonomous offshore power system or an AOPS, you really can think about that as being that power and data backbone. So connecting the data cloud to the to the ocean, and you know, as I like to say that the, the ocean's a power desert, and where there's no power, which really a, a a desert of usable power, right? You always have to take people and machines offshore anytime you want to do anything, um, in order to provide power. Because where there's no power, there's no data, and where there's no data, you really just can't operate on an autonomous basis or an un unattended basis. There's a, a, a group uh, called the Ocean Data Alliance, and they have this stat that there are 35 billion IoT devices, Internet of Things devices on land, but only 10,000 in the ocean. So there, there's no Internet of Ocean Things because there's no power. And that's hey. really the problem that we're looking to solve is available, affordable, acceptable power, which then begets data connection uh, in the ocean. And then if you think about it, the, the those that are operating in the ocean, those that are trying to collect data, those that are doing research, those that are doing work in the ocean, once there's available power, there's available data, then you know there's really sort of no limit to the things that we can do because it's expensive operating in the ocean um, and it's complex and it can be dangerous. And so that's really the, that's the, the things to, that's our mission is to really make it uh, less costly, less carbon intensive, uh, and less complex. Uh, um, it's just a dynamic environment, right? It's like the, the it's the water, it's the sea, it's the it's the salt, salinity, all kinds of things factor in there, and accessibility. So if you want to really monitor some part of the ocean, you got to take your power generation with you, perhaps in most most cases, I would assume. That's right. right. So if you right now, a sensor that's gathering med ocean data, and it can be, you know, really sort of anything understanding um, uh, melting sea ice or um, really trying to understand global warming and ocean temperatures and how they're changing over time. So any anything that you're trying to sensor to monitor or inspect it, it, it it's uh, uh, usually run by batteries now. And so what that means is that you're not getting real time data um, because there's just not enough juice. And, you know, the entire ocean economy has been built on a, a power constrained basis. Right. Mm -hmm. So you'd be shocked at how little power it takes to run a sensor, maybe 100 watts, same that a, a bright light bulb um, can run a, a suite of sensors in the ocean. But is. The, there's a couple problems with just battery powered equipment. One, um, that means you got to go out and get it and, and change the battery. And that's very expensive. It also means you don't get access to your data. And if you have to wait six months to send a ship out and a crew to go retrieve the data set, what if something's gone wrong? So you've lost your data. I mean, we were talking to somebody last week that has a very important MedOcean data gathering campaign. And they really don't know for six months whether maybe one of the sensors flooded and they got to start all over again and, and time's money and it's, real, it's really expensive. So if you can provide real time data or at least real time notification that everything's OK or everything's not OK, that can be huge from a cost and uh, time perspective. It's like I'm both the communicating the state of the device that's out there and also generating enough power to run it would then cut out all the boating out there, planning when you're going to go to bring bring new battery cells or whatever it is for these devices. Yeah, wow. That's right. So, so ships are expensive. So in in an ROV or an AUV, so a remotely a remotely operated vehicle or an autonomous underwater vehicle, an ROV support vessel, it may cost fifty, seventy five hundred thousand dollars a day. And uh you know, a smaller vessel that would go out to retrieve a data set still going to be expensive, twenty five, thirty five thousand dollars a day. If you can avoid, say, one trip every year or you can extend visits to every 18 months or 24 months, that's a huge savings um, to to uh, to the customer, to the data owner. 
Wow. Okay. So that's okay. That makes starts to make sense. And, and well, these are these are going to be really specialized projects, right? Like they're not, you know, that'll be like they're surveying a piece of ocean floor because there's a shipwreck they discovered for historical purposes, or they're monitoring some pipeline cable, right? Um, I mean, they may have already tools around that, but like, what are some of some of the potential examples? that you see commercialization for the for the C ray for the C ray right and yeah. you you mentioned this earlier but you know we consider the C ray one way to think about it is it's the combination of an offshore charging station and a data server in a cell tower but out in the ocean and so from an application perspective um, if you think about from a security perspective so intrusion detection you can create a virtual fence so to speak in the ocean, which is just something that's not really possible now um, because of the lack of power, unless you run a subsea cable, and subsea cables are are, are incredibly expensive. Uh, you can be, as we've talked about a couple of times already, med ocean data gathering. So maybe I'm trying to understand acidification, what's going on, and we need long-term data gathering. So, you know, that's also one, or maybe you've got a piece of you've got subsea infrastructure that you want to monitor to make sure that all is going okay maybe it's offshore oil and gas or offshore wind mm -hmm. and so you want to put a subsea vehicle down there that can operate 24 by 7 um could be the same with pipelines or cables so it's really there is so much that goes on out on the ocean that we really don't think about on an everyday basis because it's just kind of out of sight out of mind but the ocean economy is two trillion a year getting ready to go to three trillion in the next decade so uh, there's there's Wait, a say that again? That goes, the ocean the, the, the ocean the, economy it's a two trillion dollar piece of the global economy heading towards three trillion within the next 10 years talking about shipping too right Every, shipping thing, yeah everything. that's that's okay. that's that's everything and you know in shipping is uh Maybe I hesitate to say it, but it's a little bit of a, 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 a dirty secret. So if, if ocean shipping were a country, it'd be the seventh largest polluter on Earth. Now, mm -hmm. there's tons of work going on within that industry to go to electrification, to go to uh, hydrogen pulsed vessels, um, lots of effort that's going on to reduce it. But it's, you know, there is a, it's a very carbon intensive part of the economy and you know that's something that we can help fix that's another use case which is an offshore charging network for electric vessels so if you think about the the onset of of evs electric vehicles um personally owned everyone for a while was tethered to your garage right your your range in that unit was determined by whatever the range of the unit is and then you get range anxiety okay i got to go back home and, and plug back in but is uh, uh, charging stations start to proliferate, whether it's at work or where you shop or along the highway, they become much more ubiquitous, much more uh, uh, really efficient and productive. Same thing is going to happen for vessels offshore, whereas now they're tethered to port because that's where the charging is. But if we can create charging nodes offshore, that becomes much more effective and efficient and productive. And that's a, another use of the technology. Oh, okay. But we have to scale these things in production, right? So you guys started as a startup mode, what, like 10 years ago, right? So it's sort of proving the technology, putting the component, designing the elements. You, you try to get as much off the shelf stuff you can use, right? To reduce costs. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. And that's, that's, right. part of, that's part of the engineering that's stage one and i think you put it you i read somewhere you put it in somewhere for about a few months or more and then you pulled it out and study well or what was the impacts on the on the design that we have and where are improvements right so that's kind of where i stopped like where was that what was the next stage are you in like in a production stage or are you still like more of a finding the right customers that could then buy these units that you that you're assembling at the moment um like w w where are you in that that zone yes so we are with the c-ray product in the early stages of commercialization okay. you know, the customers that's not an issue 
uh, the use cases, that's not an issue. It's, okay. it's building a field history and uh, uh, building the credibility and the trust. So when when C Power first started out, we licensed a technology from Oregon State University. Oregon State in the U.S. is one of the centers of academic gravity for wave energy research. And our product development and delivery team is still based in Corvallis, Oregon, where where, where OSU is. And that original uh, uh, mission, and it's still a mission of ours, is offshore wave farms, so grid-connected large systems. And then we did a project in 2016. We were part of a team on a DARPA project, um, which was looking at the opposite end of the scale, so really a 100-watt system. And that's really where our head started to turn to understand that um, you know, ocean residents, resident equipment, autonomous equipment, robotic equipment, digital and electric equipment uh, had no power, ready power supply. So that's where we took what we learned on the Stingray, which is the the offshore waveform technology, the, the big system, and applied it to the, the smaller systems. And the smaller systems are the first ones to commercialize, to answer your question, mm -hmm. because there is, there's a glaring need, and it's where there's such a cost imbalance between the cost to acquire data um, and, you know, really what that data is, is worth. And so that's why we see such a, a, a ready acceptance of the system. And, you know, if we could snap our fingers and have a production ready system now, then it, it would be great. But we're, we're getting there. We sold our first unit. Um, that was to a, a U.S. Navy project run by the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. So we've sold the first one and we're getting in production mode now. We've just... Um, uh, been awarded a, a new a Department of Energy product to to lead to the next generation C Ray that gets us into full commercialization. So we're we're very close to being in production of uh, of that system. The Stingray is still a couple of years away. C Ray, okay. And we should probably talk about the power generation of each of these things, or the the range that you have. Sure. Design. I mean, sure. C Ray. Where are you at with that? The, the C Ray will go from half a kilowatt. Uh, again, you'd be just shocked what could be run in the ocean with half a kilowatt of average production up to about 20, 25 kilowatts. And that's generation capacity. You know, a, a, a 20 kilowatt system is going to produce a different amount of um, power over a year's period off the Oregon coast or in the North Sea than it would in the Gulf of Mexico or off the, the coast of, of Africa. Wave, right. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's, so it's a tropical environment versus a temperate zone in, environment. The Stingray uh, takes up where the Sea Ray leaves off and you started, you know, 100 kilowatts uh, and then works its way up to, to megawatt scale. The first Stingray mm -hmm. that we'll produce is a 200 kilowatt system. So we're we're really trying to uh, mm -hmm. to cover both ends of the market with a technology that is slightly adapted, I guess you would say, to the to the needs and uses of of each of those various market segments. The um, the um, these projects though are still going to have to be designed around the customers like the most desire desired optimization right you're, you're still in that spot you're not creating a product that you can just launch by the tens or 20 you know hundreds into the sea in a given moment right not... no that, that's that's exactly what we're doing so we oh, okay. very yeah no we've worked really hard over the last three years um in a customer customer discovery mode to understand you know, what creates that sort of swiss army knife of for wave for wave power, for for power and data in the ocean, and that's why you know in the beginning I don't care really what the we don't care what the mobile or the static asset is, what the piece of equipment is, you know our system is geared towards being able to support that that unit. Now depth will will vary, and you know where you are in the world world one of the world's oceans will vary again. The Gulf of Mexico is different than the North Sea, and so what we do is we look at the asset, and we have various models, you know, like a two kilowatt version and a 10 kilowatt version and a 20 kilowatt version. And and we match the resource. We look at decades of historical wave resource data and we look at what the 
the electricity, the energy needs of that specific piece of equipment is or group of package of equipment. Um, and we match those things together and we come up with a configuration. So, okay, we'll, we're going to give you the 10 kilowatt C-Ray and we're going to give you 400 kilowatt hours of energy storage on the bottom. And that will deliver reliable power for you for the next 20 years for whatever your for whatever your asset is. And so that's really how how we look at it. So yes, there is a matrix of different configurations, but our goal this year is to knock to knock out and understand what those specific configurations are that cover the market. But the basics of the system are the same. Capture and convert wave energy, turn it into electricity, and then provide the power and the data conduit. Right. Um, and do you, I mean, are these customers thinking like communicating with this via satellite for the data extraction or the data storage or just getting close enough with the boat, grabbing the signal, you know, pulling it off? Like, what are the ideas, what are some of the ideas around that? Yeah, that, that that's, that's a great question. So the, the system that we are splashing in the water, the sea ray that's going in the water this summer um, off of uh, Oahu, off Marine Corps Base, Hawaii, and Oahu. That system will use an LTE connection, a cell okay. mobile phone connection to communicate. It could be direct wireless, um, but it could also be satellite. So with the with the new generation of this of the C Ray um, coming out early next year, that'll be satellite enabled. So what with the onset of the low Earth orbit satellite systems, the LEOs that creates a perfect opportunity to have lower cost, um, more uh, effective satellite comms. Because again, if the point is to be in very remote locations, there may not be an LTE uh, connect, uh, signal there. There may not be some other piece of infrastructure to have a direct wireless connection. So we have to have satellite comms and that's just part of the package and that's part of the, um, the competitive advantage that, that we're bringing to the market is to having that full service uh, technology opportunity. And that, I mean, that's stuff that doesn't have to be on all the time. It could just turn on periodically, like one, you know, during a day, send that's up right. and down and just keep, keep, and then it, and then the waves just generates the power of storage again. So it just keeps for more intervals, but you don't have to keep going back out there. To that's right. More it, power. It, you know, it, there are lots of different techniques. So, you know, you may be, uh, let's say we have a uh, an autonomous underwater vehicle that's doing bottom surveys, looking for changes to the bottom. You know, it gets a mission from the cloud that comes down through the AOPS, through our system. The, the, the drone basically goes off, does its job, comes back, dumps its data. We can process that data locally. And maybe we're just sending an all's okay signal back to to the data owner or maybe we're feeding all that survey back i mean the amount especially in europe the amount of survey work and pre-construction work for offshore wind is astronomical that needs to be done over the next 30 decades oh. it's never going to get done with with crude vessels um so you're going to have to have autonomous unattended ways to to collect all that data and get it back so by processing that data compressing it we can send it you know again back through a a a, a cell or or a satellite signal for intrusion detection maybe it's the same thing you know all's okay all's okay all's okay nope it's not okay somebody needs to come out here and take a look or you need to dispatch the uh, autonomous drone to go take a peek to see what's going on or maybe the like you like you mentioned the the sensors are only operating for 10 minutes every hour uh in order to and you know that's sufficient but i think what we usually find when we start talking to a customer and they're they start warming up to this idea of not unlimited power, but more power availability. The conversation usually quickly goes from, can you run this 10 minutes an hour to, oh, wait, can we put another sensor down there? And can we put maybe a third sensor down there? Yeah, and I'd that. love to run them, <laughs> you know, five times an hour or six times an hour. It's just sort of like kid in a candy store kind of kind of a thing. And and I think that really speaks volumes to that core problem that we're trying to help uh help our customers solve, which is the lack of power offshore and what it can mean when you when you do get uh can't get your hands on it. These are like an away station for like comms and power 
and start sure. dropping them in certain spots, strategic spots, and then have these whatever device. Or, I mean, just I just it just hit me the surveying of the ocean floor for you know for new wind wind turbines to come in, right? You have to that has to be done before you can start dropping equipment in there. Right? Sure, it, you know, in 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 Europe, in the in the uh, in Western Europe, Atlantic Arc. Uh, you have also you also have to do what's called a UXO survey or an unexploded ordnance survey. So if you're, oh. you're putting a farm in the North Sea, um, you know, or in the English Channel, you know, anywhere, it's it's imperative to make sure that there is nothing laying on the bottom that could cause great harm um, if it was touched or jostled. So there's a there is an absolute ton of work that has to be done that's just not doable with with what the infrastructure that we currently have so and there's plenty of work that's going on um uh, for autonomous uh, uh ship uh manufacturers technology development that's going on there at sea charging nodes uh you know it's there's a whole ecosystem that's going on trying to conquer that problem and you know we're there we're happy to help by providing power and data how do you, you know, you're the the CEO, and you were your 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 background is in in finance, and right, you worked in I forgot the company you you worked at some venture capital work in the past, right? So that's right, that's right. So they honed you hard to figure out like when do we get to profitability? <laughs> How quickly can you know those kinds of things? Um, you know, there was it's it's sort of a funny story. There was no grand plan there. I happened to be uh, on a conference panel with one of the co-founders, and I was working at uh, the venture firm uh, at that point. And he, they were getting ready to go look for their first outside capital, and said, "Will you just come take a quick peek and you know give us your thoughts on on what we should do and where we should head?" And uh, I, one hour turned into a couple hours the next week turned into a couple hours the next week and you know next thing you knew i was just absolutely sort of head over heels for it and there was a couple things um that were really fascinating to me and and drew me in and you know keep me charged up every day you know one of which was we talked about wind and solar in the beginning there really should be three primary renewable resources. It should be wind, solar, and the ocean. Um, there's too much energy that's available in the ocean to neglect it. And you know, you only get so many chances in life to bring a new renewable to the world. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge challenge, which I just loved. Um, to uh, the sea power, the, uh, the original team, there was no sort of founder's baby technology. It was a really an open-ended exploration of, you know, what, you know, what makes the most sense from a power conversion perspective, what makes the most sense from a materials perspective. And then the form factor was allowed to change and it did change. And that's, that's part of what takes a long time to do is we're, I don't know, we're probably on our sixth generation of system that, and we probably modeled two or 3000 different ways to, cost effectively capture and convert electricity, which is why we were so successful in that DARPA project, because we had really um, done most of the heavy lifting already. So there, there was that in, in the, the technology team's approach, which was awesome. And there was also just this market. I, again, if you could snap your fingers and have a perfectly commercial ready system, um, there would be a massive market that was available. So, you know, there was a, there was a lot of different things which drew me in, and and I think keeps our team um, motivated and happy. And you know, we we've been hiring some folks here recently, and just inspiring to hear them think about the impact that they want to make and bringing another renewable to to the world. Just same same sort of vision that I have. So it, it's great. We're we're very excited about the position. We're very excited about the market and our technology and what lays ahead for us over the next couple of years. I mean, part of any, you know, especially kind of the product, this product engineering uh, types of businesses, you're sort of trying to engineer the solution just before the wave of potential customers are going to come hit it, right? And you're trying to, 
get to that right moment. And, you know, 10 years doing it means you're 10 years ahead of anyone who would start today. Right. So that's kind yeah. of a moat concept piece. And we do know that autonomous vehicles of all kinds is it going to it's going to explode in scale on all on all levels. Right. I mean, there's that's like right. a there's like a famous interview with Elon. I always keep referencing Elon on this damn show. Um, but he was talking to some Air Force general. I can't remember. And he said something to him like just off the cuff, like the, the age of the uh, jet fighter is over. And I don't know if the general took that too well, gave, gave this look, but the idea that we can fly devices and the thing that's the limiting rate factor of a jet fighter is the human being in there. There's only so many G-forces you can put that human being through before they, before you can't, before we have to just take that person out and make this an autonomous drone, right? Yeah. Um, it's going to happen the same way in the, in the ocean. Absolutely. Without a doubt, without a doubt. So, and, you know, we have our, our technical team, our, our engineers, um, you know, we've got a team really that it's second to none. They've done an incredible job. Uh, the innovation that we've experienced over really over the last 10 years is just incredible. And, and you know, like you said, it, there is there's a long gestation period here. But again, it's a, it's a difficult problem to solve. But once you do get it solved, it really can be, um, it's an overused word, but it really can be a game changer. Um, I mean, that's what, that's what these types of technologies are going for. That's, that's right. The, the, Absolutely. The full crime. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah. and it, you know, <laughs> you were using the analogy of a way, sometimes I use the analogy of being on the right corner when the marching band comes by and mm -hmm. the band's coming, right? For what, what Elon is is alluded to and what the rest of the world knows. And we see it from top to bottom in very large organizations. They, they get it and they understand what it can mean from a cost and complexity and carbon emissions reduction perspective. And really most, most everybody is completely on board with that. So it's, uh, it, it, it wish again, I could snap my fingers and make it happen. It's just, you know, you, you can't do that. You got to go through the motions and you got to do it right. You got to do it safely in order to, to build that credibility and build that field history. And that's, that's the phase that we're in right now. What has surprised you from when you decided, oh, this looks really good. I can really dedicate my life towards back then. Yeah. I mean, you got to go in with certain assumptions and you're going to learn as you go through this process of engineering the six up to the sixth version or whatever it is, what has, what has surprised you now from that whole process? If you reflect back on it, was it, a, was it an engineering challenge or was it like a customer education challenge or was it just sort of like finding the right market? I mean, what is that spot where you're like, wow, I didn't, yeah, that's a, it's another great question. You know, I think any entrepreneur has to have some level of self delusion because if you really understood, <laughs> <agree>. or really, <laughs> you, <laughs> if you really thought about just how long and how hard something like this is, or really anything else that anybody does from, knew, from an innovative knew, perspective. And I just thought about it. If you actually knew, you probably wouldn't have done any business. Any entrepreneur it, will always make that comment. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, I mean, it, 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 and I think that's, it's the realization of always just how hard and how difficult and how many things that you have to, to deal with. Uh, and, you know, we're a small company. We've been a small one for, for a while. Uh, and uh, where that's starting to change now is we're bringing on um, more more resources, but I think that's probably the biggest thing is that um, that realization process that you always go through. It's like okay, well, we conquered that. Oh, but there's three more things that we need to conquer in order to move to the next step. So it, it's sort of a um, uh, n never ending. But you know, if it was easy, everybody'd be doing it. Right. So there's no. There's no one spot. It just it's just, it's just a continuous process of development, learning, and then reapplying and reflecting on. I think on that the I think that's right. 
I think that's right. And, you know, it's, we've had, we've had a great set of investors who, um, you know, knew they were getting in for a, a longer haul than, you know, what, uh, um, you would normally see. And, uh, that's been, you know, equally important to, to our success is, is them staying, uh, staying behind us and supporting us and urging us forward. And, uh, you know, that along with a great team puts us where we are, puts us where we are today. But yes, I, I, I think that's probably the biggest surprise because, you know, the, the customer base is still there ready to go. Um, just like it always has been. And it's probably, you know, multiples, maybe orders of magnitude, uh, the size of where I thought it was, you know, when, when I first joined the company. Um, so maybe that's a, an equal surprise is just how quickly people buy into the concept. You know, it's, you got to show them um, and you got to prove to them that you can do it. But I, maybe that's been another pleasant surprise on, on the upside. Right. I think that's the, that's probably the, the, the biggest challenge with the engineering types of projects, right? You have to really sh prove it, but then each customer has a different set of that, you know, features they're looking for. So you almost have to have a lot of discovery beforehand. Like, well, what are you really trying to solve? And getting that conversation going is always, um, I don't know, is it, a, has it been a challenge for you or, you know, I tend, I tend, we work in software systems and it's just, sometimes you realize you're talking to a customer that doesn't actually know what they want. So then you got to help them get to the, get to that spot so that you can then go, okay, and this is how our system could help you in this spot, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the one thing that we don't want to do is have one-off products and you, you alluded to this mm -hmm. earlier in a question. And so, yes, that customer discovery is, uh, is, is incredibly important and that's hardest on the technical team, right? It's easy for me to go and spend two weeks talking to customers or going to a conference and coming back, uh, you know, sort of like somebody's crazy uncle that's always bringing, you know, the set of drums or something back and, you know, going to drive the parents crazy when the kids start banging on the drums, but, you know, for instance, when we started with the 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 C Ray and the in the version within this current DOE and US Navy supported project, it was a very simple system. It was the unit on the surface, uh, a synthetic mooring line, no power data, no energy storage on the bottom, and, and really just the concrete clump weight on the bottom. And over an 18 month period, as we we're going through that discovery phase. You know, we added the energy storage, we added the asset management, we added the ability to communicate from an LTE perspective. And now we show up, we're going to show up with the unit this summer, which is running uh, a, a Saab Sabertooth AUV, and it's running um, uh, an environmental monitoring system from a company, Seattle, uh, Washington State-based company called Biosonics, and uh, another company, Fugro, is going to have a Medosha data gathering system, and we'll do methane hydrocarbon leak emissions detection. So mm -hmm. we moved from what was an incredibly simple system in a very fast period, and that's that adaptation to understanding what did the customer need, and then the ability to actually prove that it's going to happen. That's a that's a lot of pressure almost never really had a design freeze, which is a huge no-no, as you know, um, because the thing was evolving so fast. And that was because everybody was like, okay, you're the missing piece of the puzzle here to do all these things that we want to do in the ocean from from an autonomy and a robotics and an AI perspective. Um, so it was, it, it was fun. It was incredibly stressful on the engineering team, but they've just done a superior job in, in um, not only battling the challenges that they had to overcome, but battling, you know, me, the crazy uncle that keeps bringing <laughs> gifts home all the time. So, yeah. The CEO, crazy uncle. Yeah. I mean, then this sounds exciting because then that's sort of like, here's your provable case studies that you can then start to experience. Then it's like when you're a small bespoke company and you have to engineer something that's really difficult, you got to take those first customers and try to like w design towards the them. That's right. But then once you got a couple of those underway, there'll be others that start to look at that, go, we kind of want that. And now you have a little bit more leverage to go, all right, but we designed this system this way. 
maybe you can design some of your systems components towards the product for a lower cost, right? If, we, if you can get to a point where you're making the same unit at certain quantities, then you can get costs, you know, from a from a technical perspective, right? Cost down. That, that's right. You know, we're we're competing, we're competing against a couple of things. One, we're competing against doing nothing because you haven't had the capability. We compete against subsea power cables, which are incredibly expensive. Uh, we compete against topside vessels, which again we've talked about are expensive and, and carbon intensive. So yes, it's that. And what we find currently, which is what you're talking about, is now that the power and the data capability is there over a long-term basis, what, and, and, and people have been working on, you know, Saab and SIPEM and others have been working on resident vehicles. But now that the capability is here, you have to start thinking about, you know, if I'm leaving that thing on the bottom for a number of years, I got to start thinking about biofouling, which I really hadn't had to worry about before. Mm -hmm. So that's the improvements that have to be made from a customer perspective. You know, power and data, we can give you the right inter interface. Do you want DC? Do you want AC? Do you need Ethernet connection? Um, you know, what is the what are the right protocols? But it's really starting to hone. How do I make this system resonant? How do I keep the biofouling or the corrosion or whatever it is, you know, at bay over a long enough period in order to enjoy the opportunity that's now been afforded to us? At 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 the cost that a customer is willing to pay, right? That sure. they, that they, that right. they can leverage for their operations where they go, wow, that's actually pretty compelling. That that that's right. Cost. And, uh, you know, if you think about that ROV or that AUV support vessel, you know, if it costs 75 grand a day and that system on the seafloor, if it's only burning 30 or 40 or 50 kilowatt hours over a day's period of electricity, that's expensive energy, right? That's, you start talking about a thousand dollars a kilowatt hour orders of magnitude more than what you pay to keep your house lit on okay. and umbilicals uh seafloor uh power and data cables and that's easily half a million to a million dollars a mile so you don't have a to mile, get very, wait, a mile wow you don't have to get very that is installed so that's capex and installation and all the survey work you don't have to get very far offshore to where you're starting to talk very substantial numbers. So, uh, you know, if producing power for less than a thousand dollars a kilowatt hour, you know what, that's pretty easy. So there's, there is a, a, a really a massive opportunity and that's the economic side of, of what's going on here in this very substantial, um, opportunity that we see in front of us is you can save people a lot of money and you can <laughs> save a lot of carbon emissions and people can stay at home and be safe and they can go home each night rather than being on a vessel for 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 two weeks so mm -hmm. it, there, there there's a lot going on here there must be a ton of projects that just get cut on the cutting room floor of ideas because of the cost that you just mentioned that just never reach like, oh, well, it's not possible because it takes half a million dollars to lay down a cable for a mile to power something or, yeah. you know, oh. they're just, they're just forget, they're not just ruling it out. So that might be even just the challenge of like expressing through the marketplace of people that think about these things, like we have a solution here that can, that can substantially reduce the energy cost and, oh, and extend your reach really, which is what you're doing with yes. that cable in real time or near real time data it, it, it is it just gets back to that part of the conversation where when you start having a discussion with somebody like oh well, while we're there let's do this and let's do that and let's do that so it, it's uh part of part of the growth will be part of the challenge is to expand you know potential customers their minds over what is the realm of the possible today versus what's the realm of the possible tomorrow and that's literally tomorrow um uh as opposed to 10 years down the road from now so that's that's where, a, that's the really fun part of it where are you at right now with like your capacity for like how many of these projects can you sort of do before you're 
technical team and your manufacturing guys freak out? <laughs> um, that's a, another great question. This is where the crazy uncle starts probably showing up again. Um, uh, you, you know, we have the ability, we've got a great supply chain and that supply chain is like any other supply chain has had a rough go mm -hmm. over the last two years and, and lead times are still extended, especially sort of the smaller and the more complex a component is, maybe the longer the lead time is, you know, but the machine shops are going full tilt too today. So, you know, if somebody showed up and said, hey, I want to extend our LTE network offshore, um, off of a city um, or in some training range, you know, can you produce five of the units? We'll produce those five. If somebody wanted 10 or 15, we'll get those things built because we are, we've got enough now under our belt where we've got the basic system uh, under control. Anything we do from here on out is, is an enhancement. You know, we're, we're good in shallow water today, but we want to be in thousands of meters of water that comes with the next project. So there, there's plenty of things for us to do and we can get those units kicked out. We effectively run a fabulous operation where we ship, where we farm out most of the fabrication and, and heavy assembly work. So we can, we can always make that, make that happen. Um, and is there, is there know how that can be licensed here at some point or is there, is there future things like that that you think about or it's just still do quite bespoke stuff. So, you know, kind of depends on the problem at hand. Yeah, license is not the business model okay. um, that we would prefer. Uh, we'd also not prefer to be in the capital equipment sales business. Really the model that we want to employ is energy and data as a service. Okay. So if you think about someone that wants to do something offshore, where they're faced with, you know, that CapEx decision of a new subsea cable or heavy OpEx decision of a topside vessel, I want to remove all that friction. And I'm just going to charge you by the kilowatt hour that you consume and the megabyte that we transmit to the cloud for you. And oh, so really, you'll yeah, charge them just on the energy consumption and the sure that's where Why you're headed. Not? Why not? Wow! You know, just re just remove all the friction from that from that it's part of making. yes. So, well, how much? How, okay. Well, how much is a unit to get in the water range? If you don't, want, you don't have to share. If you don't want, now, I'm not going to share. I'm not going to share that part. Um, okay. <laughs> and and I'm just I'll just say that we can save our customers a ton of money, and we can make their decision making process that much easier by heading down the path with energy and data as a service. Wow. Okay. So then the decision gets easy because it's sort of like, well, how much energy do you need? What are you currently paying? Well, here's where we can be. Do you want it? <laughs> right. right. That's right. That's right. Value pricing. We'll, 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 we'll share in, you know, the value that we create. And then as you bring on those customers that buy five units or 10 units, then that money can get rolled into even strengthening your supply chain, your fabrication relationships, everything. That's right. Improves That's right. That point. That's right. And, you know, and look, there, that business model, energy and data as a service, EDAS, as we shorten it, uh, you know, you, you're building a proprietary fleet. You then become responsible for the maintenance. Um, and, you know, that, that puts pressure on technology that puts pressure on the engineering team to come up with you know the ability to hot swap systems um uh, and get them in and out um from from shore quickly so you know there's again every new accomplishment gets you to a level where you gotta then conquer another three or four things as we were talking about earlier and so edas as a business model is incredibly exciting and will be the way of the world i'm sure as we go forward but you know, it's there's uh, um, it won't be as it won't be as profitable tomorrow as it will be in in five years. But it's it's a it's a wonderful opportunity for us. That's the that's the direction to scale. Then at that point, it's get you start showing the this return it's re recurring revenue usage from your customer base that you then you can raise more capital to put you know to buy more of the equipment, and you have a clear path to the future at that point. That's right. That's right. Wow. 
that's awesome. Thank you. I wish you the best in this endeavor. And I'd love to hear more once you get these case studies, once you get these next projects out into the ocean. I want to I want to know more. I want to know more. That'd be this great. Is, this is inc- this is incredible. And like I, I think my just and I, I'm not an expert in any of these worlds, but I just got a feeling that anybody's positioning themselves the way you guys are, the the future is pretty bright because the pressures are coming for more of this stuff, not less. So that's what you can guarantee. You just gotta be around long enough and be at the right moment with the right customer base. Then that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. All right. Well, thank you so much. If somebody wants to find out more information, they should go to, it's not Columbia Power, it's cpower.co, right? Yeah, it's, so cpower.co. And uh, you know my email address is r, Leesman, so r-l-e-s-e-m-a-n-n at cpower.co. You know, feel free to drop me a line if, if you're a customer or you'd like power and data or... Um, you know, like to be part of our supply chain or you'd like to join the company, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to love to entertain all those discussions. But awesome. Ernesto, this has been great. I've, I've been a fun conversation and I look forward to giving you an update in the future. Open door. Thank you, Mr. Rents. Mr. Leesman, thank you very much. Please call me Rents. Yes. Rents. Crazy okay. Uncle Rents. Yeah. Crazy yeah. Uncle Rents. <laughs> <Rents. laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Um, thanks again for getting on that YouTube channel. Just noticed if you would be jumping on. Thank you. Visit throughthenoise.us for more episodes and subscribe to our newsletter. This show is produced by Through the Noise Consulting, uniting external communications and internal IT functions to ensure data and privacy are protected while creating innovative communications platforms. Want to start your own podcast? We can help. Visit getthroughthenoise.com to learn more.